Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 3 of Stuff I Googled This Week. The show by the ignorant, for the ignorant, in an attempt to make us all a bit less ignorant. Really starting to regret that tagline, because ignorant is very difficult for me to say for some reason. Um, it's been a little wait since week two. I've actually been taking uh, a few days off of voice stuff. Uh, I was having a lot of allergies that were just tearing up my throat, and I was getting a lot of swelling and stuff, so this is kind of my trial run before I get back into work work. You lucky ducks. As the weeks go by, I'm starting to get a little more structure to this. Uh, This week I've actually got it a little broken down. I've got joke, topic, and then a weekly segment, and then another topic, a joke, and then another topic, you know. We're getting organized up in here. Hope you've all been having a wonderful week. You know, obviously I'm not getting a huge amount of views on these videos, and uh, consequently not a huge amount of comments, but if you like what you hear or if you have any questions for me or any comments about the stuff, please comment. While you're down there, maybe like and subscribe too, but I just really want to start a conversation. Nobody else has said that on YouTube. Anyway, that's enough preamble. Let's just jump right into it. Also, as a side note, I was going to talk about irony this week, because I never really know what it means. Like, I have a basic grasp, but not enough to actually put it into words. And, like, any time I say if something is ironic, I always pause and I get a little scared because I'm so concerned that it's going to be, that's not ironic, that's a coincidence. But, yeah, even after half an hour of research, I still didn't feel comfortable enough to actually do it. (laughs) So, yeah. Skipping it. Let's start off with a joke. Get everyone in a good mood. I went to the bank the other day, and this old lady asked if I could check her balance. It turns out it was terrible. She fell right over, and I barely even tapped her. Aha, but um, All right, with that festivity out of the way, let's start with our first topic, which is the origin of the name Golf. I'm sure we've all heard that it stood for gentlemen only, ladies forbidden, which sounds pretty far-fetched. It's kind of one of those things that everybody says at the schoolyard, along with the whole rumor about Marilyn Manson and his removed rib. But it is not an acronym. It actually derives from the Dutch word kolf, or kolv, which means club. I don't know if those are proper pronunciations. It's a, it's a guess. It became guff, or guff in late 14th century, early 15th century Scotland, and then by the 16th century, so the 1500s, for those who get confused by that kind of nomenclature, it became golf. Yeah, you know, while we're talking about it, let's talk about some other golf terms. Birdie, for those who don't know golf, birdie is when you get one stroke under par, uh, originated in the U.S. in 1899. Apparently four guys were playing, one hit the ball super close to the hole, and he said... Oh, that was a bird of a shot. That's my 1899 U.S. accent. It's flawless. So they started calling it a birdie if you got one under par. Uh, This evolved into eagle, which is two under par, and albatross, which is three under par. Next we have bogey, which nowadays stands for one over par. Now there are kind of conflicting reports on where it actually originated, but I'll go with this one from Etym Online, which is like an etymology website. It says, One popular song, at least, has left its permanent effect on the game of golf. That song is The Bogeyman. In 1890, Dr. Thomas Brown, RN, the Honorable Secretary of the Great Yarmouth Club, was playing against Major Wellman, the match being against the, quote, ground score, which was the name given to the scratch value of each hole. So the scratch value means the score that you should be able to get if you were a pretty good golfer. The system of playing against the ground score was new to Major Wellman, and he exclaimed, thinking of the song of the moment, that his mysterious and well-nigh invincible opponent was a regular bogeyman. The name caught on at Great Yarmouth, and today bogey is one of the most feared opponents on all the courses that acknowledge him. So yeah, that's how it started. So for a while, par and bogey were kind of used interchangeably, By the 1900s, par was known as the ideal score for pro golfers, and bogey came to be known as the score recreational golfers would shoot for. 
Next, we have four. I'm sure we've all heard four when somebody hits a ball off and it's going to hit somebody. This started in Scotland. Uh, it's a short version of before or a four. Uh, it's believed to have come from the military. Uh, artillery men would warn troops by saying four. Or I guess four. Probably wouldn't roll it that much, but it's fun. Pretty easy, but it's something that not a lot of people know. And that's the origin of golf terms. Now we have our very first segment. It's called, Did You Know? Yeah, uh, listening to the last episode, I found I was being a little long-winded. So I figured I'd just fire off some fun facts. Uh, I read a lot of Uncle John's Bathroom Reader, especially growing up. And my favorite part was always the fun facts at the bottom. So I figured, hey, maybe other people want to just hear some straight facts. Ready? Let's do it. Oh, I guess we do we need a jingle? Did you know? 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 Roughly 80% of ginger cats are male, while only 20% are female. My girl Took is an outlier, yeah. Dogs were first domesticated roughly 15,000 years ago, possibly more in some areas like Siberia. By 14,000 years ago, people were burying dogs, sometimes along with humans. The first cats are believed to have been domesticated in Cyprus about 9,000 years ago. Finally, Lucy Lawless is from New Zealand. What? <laughs> she has the accent and everything. I, I know her from Xena and, like, vaguely Spartacus and, more recently, Parks and Rec, and I always assumed she was just American, especially after watching Parks and Rec. But then I saw her in Curb Your Enthusiasm, and, my gosh, it was crazy. Also, I love that accent. On that topic, I have two show recommendations, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which I've been watching the crap out of recently, and, on the topic of New Zealand, Almighty Johnson's. I don't know if you've heard about Almighty Johnson's, but it's really, really good, and sadly got cancelled a while back, it only has a few seasons, but it's really enjoyable, and it's in New Zealand. Um, brief synopsis, it's basically descendants of the Norse gods are living in modern-day New Zealand, and they're kind of going on various quests, and I won't spoil anything, but basically Odin is trying to find Frigg so that they can get their big powers back. It's really good. Going to be watching some tonight, actually. All right, next topic, we have how are mirrors made? Yeah, It's a really weird thing, because mirrors are something that we take for granted, but also if you ask 100 people how they're actually made, I bet you not a lot can tell you. So let's do a brief history first. They were around as early as 6,000 BC. Those ones are super basic, just polished obsidian so it would reflect light. I mean, technically the first mirrors were like pools of still water in a vessel, but I'm talking metal ones. But I'm talking standing mirrors. Now, later, they started using other metals to make fancier mirrors. Polished copper was found in Mesopotamia around 4,000 BC. And by the Bronze Age, they used copper, gold, silver, bronze, and others. These tarnished quickly, and they needed to be polished often. They didn't get a perfect picture either, like today, it was kind of blurry. And they were very heavy, so they tended not to be that big. Eventually, glass started being used around the first century. As technology improved in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, mirrors became clearer and easier to make. By the Industrial Revolution... Glass panes could be produced in bulk. Justus von Liebig, in 1835, invented the silvered glass mirror. This used a process called wet deposition to deposit a thin layer of metallic silver onto glass using silver nitrate. This led to a much greater availability of affordable mirrors. Now, the modern technique uses either silver, which reflects 95% of the light, or aluminum, which reflects 90% of the light. And they use a process called silvering, where they spray a thin layer of silver or aluminum on the back of glass. They also do this by heating aluminum in a vacuum, then bonding to cooler glass. And that's mirrors. It's time for our second joke of the day. So the other day, my wife asked me to pass her her lipstick, but I accidentally passed her a glue stick. She still isn't talking to me. But um, That's the dream, boys. All right, our final topic for today. If you don't care about this, stick around because we still have philosophy, remember. If you don't care about philosophy either, 
go away. I don't want you. So today's final topic is Canada's provinces and territories and their capitals, as well as their relative position above the U.S., because I suspect a lot of my, you know, 10-odd viewers are from the U.S. But even if you're from Canada, if you're like me, you probably have a pretty embarrassing knowledge of where Canada is relative to the U.S. While you have a pretty good understanding of where the provinces and territories are, and you probably know most of the capitals, I bet you get a few mixed up. I bet you do. I know, for me, Whitehorse and Yellowknife can never remember which one's which. Anyway, I'll just give the name of the province, the name of the capital, and uh, where it is relative to the U.S. and the other provinces. Cool? Cool. Uh, Before I get into that, though, let's talk about why they're called provinces and territories. The main difference between a province and a territory in Canada is that a province is a creation of the Constitution Act, which was April 17th, 1982, while the territory is created by federal law. So the federal government has more direct control over the territories, while the provincial governments have more control over the provinces themselves. So for all those Americans who assumed that Canada just had states, you're wrong. And for all the Canadians who didn't know why the heck they were called territories, there you go. All right, let's start far to the northwest, just east of Alaska, is the Yukon Territory. The capital of the Yukon is Whitehorse. As a side note, there's a Calvin and Hobbes book called Yukon Ho, and I always thought it was pronounced Yukon. It's not. Next, southeast from the Yukon and north-northwest of Washington, we have British Columbia. Capital of this baby is Vancouver. Lots of movies made over there. All right, zigzagging back up to the northeast, we have, ironically, the Northwest Territories. These are in, you guessed it, the northwest of Canada, and the capital is Yellowknife. Back on down into the east is Alberta, a.k.a. oil country. Capital is Edmonton, lots of snow, even in the southern parts, and not a lot of taxes. East of Alberta, north of Montana and North Dakota, we have Saskatchewan, lovely prairie province, capital makes all the kitties giggle because it's called Regina. Yep, that was a blast to learn in school. Okay, to the east of Saskatchewan and north of North Dakota and Minnesota is Manitoba, which I just realized sounds strangely like a combination of North Dakota and Minnesota, but, you know, probably a coincidence. Uh, The capital of Manitoba is Winnipeg, which is the namesake of the cuddly, honey-loving Winnie the Pooh. North of Manitoba, we have our last and newest territory, Nunavut. Nunavut is dear to my heart, partly because I did a project on it in school and partly because my pets are named after the language spoken there. The language is called Inuktitut, and my dog was named Inuk when we adopted her and we kept it, and then we adopted a cat recently and we named her Took after Peregrine Took, but also so that together their names are Inuk and Took, which sounds like Inuktitut which we thought had a nice ring to it. We thought it'd be a cool homage. Uh, Someone will probably call it appropriation or something, but screw it. Uh, I'll link to their Instagram in the description. They're super cute. Hopefully that will protect from cancellation. Next, to the southeast, north of, I think it's called the Midwest, like Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, and as well as New York, we have Ontario. This is where I was born and raised, and I even lived for a few years in the capital, which is Toronto. One thing to remember is Toronto is only the capital of Ontario. The capital of Canada is Ottawa, which is also found in Ontario. A lot of people get kind of confused there. East of Ontario, north of New York, Vermont, and Maine, we have Quebec. A big old province that stretches pretty far north, and the capital is Quebec City, not Montreal. This is the best-known French-speaking province, and they always try to leave the rest of Canada, which would be awkward for many reasons, not the least of which that they're right between a bunch of provinces, which would be kind of weird. East of Quebec, we have the small province of New Brunswick. I've never been there, but the pictures look nice. Capital is Fredericton. Interestingly, New Brunswick is the only province that has two official languages, which are English and French. Quebec actually only has one official language, which is French. So, all the other provinces are English, Quebec 
is only French, and New Brunswick, French and English. Southeast of New Brunswick is Nova Scotia, where my dad's from. Uh, the capital of that is Halifax. And north of Nova Scotia is Prince Edward Island, or PEI. This is where my paternal grandparents lived growing up. They had a cottage on the beach, and we'd go there in the summer. Ugh, great times. Also, the home of Anne of Green Gables. I'd love to live there because it's beautiful and cheap, but uh, I feel like the way climate change is going, it's kind of doomed. Tiny, tiny island. Finally, and confusingly, we have, to the northeast of PEI, Newfoundland and Labrador, where my mom grew up. It's generally just called Newfoundland, but it includes Newfoundland Island, as well as the continental region of Labrador, which borders Quebec. About 92% of the population is found in Newfoundland. Labrador is pretty barren. And the capital is St. John's. Also, a lot of people call it Newfoundland, but considering my mom's a Newfie and she calls it Newfoundland, I'm going to go with Newfoundland. All right, that is the Canadian provinces and territories. I hope you uh, maybe learned something. Maybe if you have a quiz, this will help there. Or, you know, if you're having a Reddit argument, maybe it'll happen to help you there. That's the best. I love when I'm in a Reddit argument and I can pull this really obscure bit of information and just, hmm, I didn't just happen to know this. No, I know lots of things. I know so much. Anyway, time for our philosophy of the day. I mean, philosophy of the day. Or... Philosophy of the day, oh, 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 we're gonna teach some philosophy. I don't know. I'll figure something out. Anyway, here I'll piggyback off the screw it, it's in the past thing. So, as I said last week, that was working quite well for me. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out episode two. But I still struggle a good deal with anxiety about the future. The thing is, with the past, there's nothing I can do to change it, so it's easier for me to get over the anxiety. It's illogical to focus on it because you can't change it. So it's easy to go, eh, doesn't matter. I'm only hurting myself by thinking about this. But with the future, it's harder to get over because I can change it. So the anxiety seems to be serving a function. Maybe if I ruminate over this problem for hours and hours, I'll think of a better way to do things and avoid failure. At least that's how my brain sees it. So what do I do to try to get over worries about the future? What I recently realized through another cannabis-inspired epiphany is I use the phrase, I wonder what will happen. This way it's less about worrying about what will happen and more of a detached curiosity. It really helps me a lot. Not as much, admittedly, as screw it is in the past, because I do still have to fight that feeling of maybe I can fix it, maybe I can avoid it. But turning it into a question of curiosity or wondering what's going to happen rather than fear or anxiety about what will happen really does help me to uh, feel less anxious about it. So give it a try. And that's it for this week. Um, my voice is feeling okay. Hopefully it's sounding okay to you. It's been very frustrating not being able to work this past week, but I have seen a lot less swelling, so I should be able to get back to work soon. But I've actually been fairly productive. I am um, writing a book of fairy tales. Since I always read a ton of fairy tales when I was a kid, I had this big old book that I read so much that it literally split in half. So I figured I'd try my hand at kind of going back to the old grim tales and then revamping them for a more modern audience. So, you know, there's stronger female leads, there's slightly more healthy relationships. Like, you know, I need to still go along with some of the tropes of fairy tales, but I feel like I've improved a lot of the stories that I've done. So that's a project for this year, and I'm hoping to have it finished uh, in time for the new year. And I can put that up and then do an audio version of it. So yeah, if that sounds interesting to you, let me know in the comments. I might uh, post a few of the stories. That'd be fun. Anyway, that's it for this week. As I said, hope you learned something. Hope you passed a bit of time. Hope I didn't bore you too much. And I hope the game went kind of well. If you watch whatever game's playing on screen. It's probably going to be Battlefront. And man, that game's 
pretty darn fun. You guys say. When the game first came out, I was working on the nerd channel, so I was all pissy about all the microtransactions and stuff. But from what I understand, they more or less took most of it out. And it was on a huge sale, so I got it. And it's fun. I get to be Star Wars. Plus, I'm not on that whole Star Wars hate bandwagon. The, oh, the SGW's ruined Star Wars. I don't know. It's fine. I digress. I apologize. Anyway, this has been episode three of Stuff I Googled This Week. I am Ron McKenzie LaFergie. Thank you for listening. And you have a wonderful week. If you have any questions, ask me in the comments, or just Google them. Later, Gators.